coming live from the John Radcliffe today. Uh, I'm just going to double check that you're coming up. And we will have a look. Welcome if you're here. Bear with me for a moment. And we will be able to start the presentation very shortly. I'm hoping you can see us. I can see you from my end. Oh. Hi, Wendy. Hi, Wendy. So, uh huh, I can see us too. Lovely. Welcome to um, everybody that's watching. I'll introduce myself and then my colleague. So, my name's Emma Rigby. I'm uh, the matron for Outpatient Services. Um, and I'm here, um, well, you get bored of seeing me actually on Facebook Live every <laughs> fortnight, but I'm always the one asking, um, uh, passing on your questions. And then I have Anita with me today. So Anita, do introduce yourself. Hello everybody, so my name's Anita. I am the team lead midwife for Oxford mm -hmm. University Hospital's case loading team. We're called the Lotus team. Um, yeah, and we provide a continuity of care service for some of the women in Oxfordshire. And we're doing something a little bit differently today. Um, Wendy Hill, who is our community matron, is actually at Whitney Hospital, um, Whitney uh, uh, Midwife-led unit, and she's joining us via Teams and is currently on a mobile phone next to a laptop. So you may well hear her voice coming through, uh, words of wisdom coming from Wendy. Um, but what <laughs> <laughs> Between the three of us, we'll hopefully answer any of the questions that you have. The topic today is community um, uh, midwife um, care, so that could cover birthing in um, the MLUs or um, com uh, community care um, in general, um, and also things like the Lotus team. So, if you have any questions for our our experts, I always say a panel of experts, and we do still have a panel because we have Wendy <laughs> on Teams and Anita here. Get your questions in on the chat. Uh, we've got 17 people currently watching us. Lovely. So hopefully lots of people um, with uh, questions. So Anita, do you want to give us a little rundown about um, the Lotus team and what you do and yeah. what you might, uh, who you might see? Yeah. So, um, with um, as I've already explained, we are the case loading team for Oxford University Hospital. So, um, what happens um, when you book in with your community midwife? And um, they do quite a thorough risk assessment, and then they'll identify um, women who would benefit from having a a service, um, which the midwife will follow them throughout the antenatal period. Will hopefully a member of our team would be at the. Um, you know, the labour and the birth, and then we'd follow them up for up to 28 days in the postnatal period. Um, there, were, there was one team um, at the moment, um, and there are um, seven to eight midwives in a continuity team, in a caseloading team. We cover the whole of the county, um, as far as Brackley, Banbury, down to Didcot, Wallingford, um, Wantage area. Um, and yes, yeah, so when when we receive referrals from the community midwives, um, we look through them, we see who and um, which women um, would benefit from our service. And then, um, yeah, we take over their care from that point on. Um, and yeah, it's, it's really, really good service. Lovely, thanks Anita. So for those that are just joining, um, I've got Anita White, who's our team lead um, for the community team, the Lotus team. And on Teams, um, we've got Wendy Hill, who's our community matron, and she's sat on Teams on a mobile phone next to the laptop. So between the two of them, they're, they're, they are your expert panel for being able to answer any questions on community or um, community care, any queries there um, during your, your maternity um, journey. So I've got a first question come in. Okay. Um, so this is from Kaylee. So welcome, Kaylee. Um, she's she's asked her midwife about a, a physio referral because she's got really bad hips, um, and she was advised to self refer. But she's twenty eight weeks and she's heard nothing. What should she do about that? 
Okay, so have have you actually completed the selfie fair and you haven't heard anything? I'm thinking she probably has because okay. she's now she got told to self refer and she's now 28 weeks and she was 14 weeks when she did the initial referral. Okay, so I mean I think um, I don't know whether you've already tried to chase it up. If you haven't, then maybe that's an option. And if that's not successful, then I would go to your community midwife and just see if they can do you a referral because that is another option. Okay. Hopefully, Kaylee, you're happy with that. So just contact your community midwife and any queries, just you know, give them a shout, mm-hmm. leave them a message. And obviously if the pain does get really bad, then you can also contact MAU if you're concerned. Lovely. So more people are joining us. Probably got a cup of tea in their hand and starting <laughs> to settle down and, 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 and watch us. So we, we've got um, Anita, who's our community lead for Lotus Team, Hello. and Wendy, who's the matron for community, who's on Teams, joining us. So do please pop your uh, questions into the chat. I think it would be good, Anita, if you were happy to talk through what to expect from your community midwife during your pregnancy. What would be the the, the appointments you may have during during your pregnancy? Yeah. So, um, when you um, go for your initial um, booking appointment with your community midwife, you should have a set of blue notes, and in there there are a couple of pages that um, that show what what sort of appointments that you would attend. Um, and what to expect at each of those appointments. So usually for your first um, pregnancy, you'll see a midwife at least 10 times in the antenatal period. Um, And for for pregnancies after that, um, it's usually about seven. Um, It depends on need. That's the minimum amount of appointments that you would expect. And they would cover things like um, screening for, for conditions like preeclampsia, um, checking the well-being of your baby, looking for any signs of infection in yourself, um, you know, making sure that any referral pathways that have been identified have been um, followed, um, making sure that you've got your scans booked, um, and looking at the results of blood, blood results or scan results and um, just to see if there's anything further that we need to do to support you with those. Thank you. The whistle to stop tour of your pregnancy. <laughs> <laughs> anything else, Wendy? Have I missed anything? It <laughs> um, depends on how in depth you want to be. Yeah. Um, but I will just say that um, I think Kaylee just put another comment in the um, uh, in the chat and about Carol Maycock, who I'm actually here with today <laughs> at Whitby, and I'm watching. This, uh, this afternoon, um, but I will be telling her your comment, Hayley, when I see her after this session. I think we're really pleased to hear that. So I'm really glad that yeah. um, she's really helped your pregnancy um, be quite a positive experience for you. Mm-hmm. Apart from obviously the lack of video referral, which I know that Carol will be straight on top of. Yeah. Each other. <laughs> can I just check that everybody can actually hear Wendy, yeah. please? Pop just a comment. Pop a comment in there if you can hear her. We've rendered everybody speechless. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm hoping nobody's popped a comment in they can't hear you, Wendy. So no. hopefully, I think we've got a couple of members of staff watching. Um, so if you want to pop just a little comment in, just to give us the thumbs up that you can hear oh, Wendy. Oh, yeah, thumbs up, lovely. Oh, yes, lovely. Perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Wendy's coming through loud and clear. That's great. Super. So, yeah, so Kaylee has put a comment up to say she's got a 28 week appointment tomorrow. So, Lovely. she'll follow all of that up and she does want to say Carol Maycock has made this pregnancy amazing. Oh, so fabulous. That's that's lovely, lovely feedback. Lovely. Um, so, Kaylee has added in another question. Oh, lots of thumbs up now. Thank you very much. <laughs> <Lovely>. <laughs> Maybe we're a bit delayed getting <laughs> messages through. <laughs> um, so um, Kaylee's just just wondering about ten times with your first pregnancy, mm-hmm. um, and that has quite surprised her. Do you get more appointments towards the end of your pregnancy? Yeah. So are you twenty eight weeks. Just remind me. I think you just said yes. twenty eight weeks. Yeah. So usually you're seeing sort of around ten weeks, um, sixteen weeks. This is routinely. So you've seen at ten weeks, sixteen weeks. Um, 25 weeks currently with the GP. So the 10 I talked about include the GP appointments. Um, 28 weeks. Um, and then going forward, 31 with the GP, 34 with the midwife, 36 
with a midwife and you also have a scan around about there um, and 38 weeks with a midwife or with your GP sometimes the midwife will see you instead of the GP that you can negotiate that with your midwife then 40 41 42 it depends on when your baby's born it depends you know on your individual need as well but that's usually the minimum amount of appointments that we'd like to see you Do you want to add anything to that, Wendy? The voice from um, beyond. I think the theme of today is sort of birth centres and home birth. Um, I'd just like to sort of touch on what happens if you're planning a community birth. Um, so a community birth is sort of defined as anything outside of a hospital. Um, so for us, that's sort of the what we call a standalone MLU, so a standalone midwifery led unit. Um, on paper, that is the Horton in Banbury, Chipping Norton or the Cotswolds Birth Centre in Chipping Norton, that's currently closed. Um, the Wantage Birth Centre, that's at the Wantage Community Hospital, that's also currently closed. And the Wallingford um, Birth Centre, that's based at the Wallingford Community Hospital, that's currently open. Um, so that's a birth there or a home birth anywhere in Oxfordshire. So that's what we are referring to when we say about community birth. So you'll be asked at booking about if you've got any ideas of where you might like to give birth. Nothing, you don't have to commit to a certain location at any point in your pregnancy. In fact, you can change your mind once you're in labour. There's, you don't ever have to sort of make a final decision. But they'll start to sort of get your thoughts very early on. And then you'll sort of be questioned a little bit as it goes on. Um, if you're sort of leaning towards one or the other and then we'll start to sort of tailor your care towards where you're planning on giving birth so for example at the 36 week appointment that Anita's already mentioned if you're planning a home birth we'll actually do that appointment at your house so we can do um, a sort of assessment with you sort of uh, educate you on what equipment you might need and what we provide what you might need to provide um, any logistics things like parking lighting um, finding your house because if you have to find a house at 3 a.m., obviously we want to know that it is really easy to get to, or there's something we need to know. Um, so you might find that your care is slightly different if you're planning on giving birth in a certain area, but it's all just tailored to you. So we do try and uh, individualise it. Um, and if you sort of want to start thinking about a birth, it's sort of in the third trimester. So this is sort of 30 ish weeks on um, that you might want to sort of start laying a bit more uh, concrete plans and then we can give you sort of tours around the surely the internet hasn't <laughs> cut her off in her prime <laughs> I've got a feeling oh, no. oh, no. you're back there. again now you're there. back again now <clears throat> carry on where did I get cut off <laughs> tours around the units <clears throat> Yeah, so um, especially if you're having your care with that team, um, when you go around, when you have a routine antenatal appointment there, um, you can ask to sort of look in one of the birth rooms, for example. So if you're going to one of the for a routine appointment, just ask them to have a quick peek in one of the pool rooms so you can sort of see the size of the pools. Same goes for the water as well. We do have um, pictures on the internet, but you might find if you're there anyway, it's a good idea so you sort of have a look and you sort of know what to expect when you're turning up in the middle of the night in labour. Um, so I was confused as well, but like I said, if you do change your mind at any point, it, it doesn't really make a difference. This is that we like to be able to give you the information to that particular choice. But of course, if you, you know, if you're in labour and you decide actually I don't want to have a home birth anymore, that's totally fine. Equally, if you plan to birth on the spires and you feel like you don't want to leave your house, also fine. We can do a last minute home birth assessment. We might just come out to you sooner rather than later in early labour, just to make sure everything's fine. But you can still choose to have. Um, any type of birth you want, even if you're in labour. You don't have to pre-book a home birth or pre-book a, um, an LU birth. Thanks, Wendy. Thank, Thank, you. You. Thank yeah. you. Lovely. We've got a couple of questions coming. Um, so, uh, Shakea has asked, what's the difference between the spires and just normal delivery? I think sweet is at the end of that, but she's put normal delivery the difference between the delivery suite and the spires? So um, delivery suite is the obstetric led unit. So that's where women will um, go to give birth if they've got any medical conditions um, where they might need some input from, from a, one of the obstetricians. Um, the spires is, and also, sorry, on delivery suite, if you opted to have an epidural as your um, choice of 
pain relief, then that would be done on delivery suite as well. Um, the Spires is midwife led, so the, there are doctors available on level two um, in delivery suite, but actually on the Spires, the midwives run the unit. Um, they attend the birth, and the Spires is for women who you know, or have a low risk normal pregnancy, everything's been fine with themselves, everything's been fine with the baby, there hasn't been any sort of medical conditions in their history that would suggest that they need to have an obstetrician available, um, readily available. And yeah, so that's that's it really. And we're actually up in spires yeah. as we speak. Yeah. We're up on level seven in one of the offices. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Hopefully that answers your question. And Kaylee has just asked about um any um uh, so can you have a water birth with a raised BMI and also what centres offer water births? Um, so all of the midwife led units offer water births, it depends on what the BMI is at booking and, and throughout the pregnancy as to whether you would um, be recommended to have your baby in a midwife led unit, that would be a risk assessment that's done um, between you and your midwife and you know if maybe you don't um, meet the criteria for a midwife led unit then there is a service that we offer where you can discuss that further um, but yeah so all of the midwife led units offer pools um, the Spires um, has um, a number of pools all of their rooms have their pools in them and on our obstetric unit we also have a room that has a pool in it I know that was out of order recently for repairs is it back on no it's so at the moment so currently it's not um, available but it's a work in progress I think is that right Wendy yeah so, um, but yeah and um, so again it's all about risk it's about you know what's safe for you and your baby and um and having that thorough conversation with your community midwife or maybe with an obstetrician you know obstetrician if you if you've got one um and having a real good plan put into place for your birth um so what else was it Anna sorry you said so that's it which centres offer the water birth yeah and can you have a water birth if you have a raised BMI yeah so raised BMI yeah again it's about um what what would your be what is your BMI and the um you know a plan is put into place even if even if you, you know you don't meet the criteria for, for a birth pool there are things that you you know there are discussions that you can have around that and um, with with various professionals um and just yeah put a real good birth plan into place to make sure that um you know you're safe and and your birth is as good as it can be thank you i hope that answers that lovely that? did you want to add anything to that wendy um it's much much of what he's already said really but we do we do have literal cut-off that figures we use but those are always caveated and that we would do an individual risk assessment and you know bmi is not always the best way to um measure your health and sometimes actually it's about your mobility so you know it, it might be women who have a lower BMI actually do struggle with mobility more in um, later pregnancy and would struggle to get out of the pool in an emergency equally you might have a woman with a raised BMI but who is very tall and has no problems getting out of the pool in an emergency so it would come down to sort of individual risk assessment on um, if you think, or with your, if you just discuss with your midwife, that you'd be able to get out, exit the pool, really. That, that's probably the biggest thing, is that if, if there's a problem in the pool, can you get out, or can we help you out? Mm -hmm. Lovely. Thanks, Thanks, Wendy. Thank you. Hopefully you found that helpful, um, Kaylee. Um, Elsie has popped a question in, just asking if this, is, if this chat is only for birth plans. But, um, Elsie, it's for... Um, the chat is sort of entitled community midwifery and, and birth centres, MLUs, it can be a, a discussion about whatever you want it to be. This is your your point to ask questions. So we're really open and if we don't know the answers, we'll find somebody that does and get back to you. So we've got a few more people have um, joined us just now. So I want you to reintroduce ourselves so people know um, who we are. So uh, I'm sure if you are regular watchers on this, I'm Emma, I'm the matron for um, outpatient services and generally ask all the questions on Facebook Live events. Um, I have with me Anita. Hello. So my name's Anita. I am the um, team lead midwife for Oxfordshire's um, case loading team, the Lotus team. And then on Teams, slightly different today, on Teams and the voice from beyond, would you like to introduce yourself? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can. I'm so sorry for joining you on Teams today. Um, I'm Anita, I'm the case loading team. 
little hiccup in Whitney, uh, which meant that I wasn't able to facilitate the session um, with the team here. Um, but I'm happy to join you. I'm Wendy. I'm the community matron at the moment. Um, so I know you can't see me, but I hope you can hear me. <laughs> If you are finding it at all difficult to hear Wendy, just pop a message in the in the chat and we'll move the mobile phone around and see whether you can get to hear her better. Okay, so we've got a couple more questions come in. So um, Elizabeth is actually asking about induction. Okay. So Elizabeth wants to know, if you're induced, what method of induction do we do? And if contractions progress on the induction ward but dilation does not progress, what pain relief is available before you move on to delivery suites? So it's slightly off from the community questions, mm -hmm. but are you happy to go through that one? Yeah, that's fine. So um, repeat it for me. There's a so I'll break it down. Yeah. <laughs> so <I can> interview, <laughs> do the best part first. So what method of induction do we use? Okay, so um, my understanding is we've recently gone back to the Proston gel method of induction. So we were doing Proston previously, that changed to a catheter. Um, and now we've gone back to Prostin. Um, so that's the method that we're using currently. Okay. Yep, yeah, lovely. And that's for, that's for most women, but it could be under discussion. If you have any queries about yeah. your induction, then chat to your community midwife or um, the obstetrician that's discussing with you about induction. So yeah, I think, I think the catheter is still available for some women, isn't it? But again, yeah. it's individualised. Yeah. Post-dates, multi-dates. Yeah, yeah. okay. But translate that for me. <laughs> so if you've had a baby before and you've gone past 42 weeks, is that right? Then you can have a catheter still. Yeah, 40, yeah. 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, um, so, I mean, it'll be it'll be all of the sort of things that you could also have when you're in early labour, really. So it'll be things like, um, you know, getting your getting your birth partner to massage. Um, maybe if you've got some, you know, of your own aromatherapy, relaxation techniques. Um, you can have paracetamol and um, dehydrocodone also prescribed for you, um, and you can have that. That's quite effective. Um, yeah, you don't get Entonox, um, you don't get gas and air in, in for, that, for that period. Usually that's offered once your labour starts to establish. Mepted. Mepted. So also Mepted, which is an opioid, that's an injection. You can have that as well. And we've started Oromorph as well. Oh, okay. So also Oromorph, okay. which is good. I didn't know that. Thank you, Wendy. Lovely. <laughs> so there is quite a variety of, of yeah. pain relief available on the ward if you do need it. And again, discuss that with your midwife. Um, and talk through the options available at the time. Lovely. Definitely. Thank you very much. Um, so Shikoa's asking, what can she expect? Um, a few more questions popping in. Mm. What can she expect in coming weeks? She's currently 33 weeks pregnant. Okay. So what would we expect to happen for, for Shikoa during her pregnancy in the way of appointments? Okay, so your next appointment should be your 34-week routine appointment. And um, where a routine antenatal assessment's done, where they'll check the baby's heartbeat. You'll be familiar with those sort of checks because you should have had them so far at all your previous appointments. You'll also get a um, blood test to check your iron level. Um, and yeah, the midwife will just want to know that you've got your 36 week scan booked. She'll probably want to arrange the next appointment as a little bit of a longer one, maybe to talk through a little bit of a birth plan um, and place of birth. Um, make sure that you know you've been looking at. Um, feeding methods and things like skin to skin and that you're familiar with those different um, sort of things that you can do when the baby's born um, yeah and just make sure all your appointments are, are in place for the rest of your pregnancy lovely thank you anything to add Wendy um, I think no it'd be interesting to know if you're planning a type of birth because um, you know I know the theme about this is community birth, but even if you're planning a delivery birth, um, we can sort of talk about that. If there's anything specific you want to know about um, sort of um, birthplace planning, now that you're 33 weeks, so do use us, uh, do use this opportunity um, to quiz us on place of birth as well, if you like. Lovely, thank you. So Elizabeth has um, has thanked you for the answer about induction. So you're very welcome. Right. 
So Elsie has popped a message into the chat. Um, it, it's, it's quite an individualised message. And what I would absolutely suggest, Elsie, is that you contact um, the maternity assessment unit with your query. And I would suggest that you do actually do that today. Um, I'm, I'm not going to read it all out, but I, I really think it's really important for you to contact uh, the maternity assessment unit. And that number is found on the inside of your blue notes. Hopefully that helps. So um, Shakara has asked, when is the earliest time you can be induced with your first baby? Well, <laughs> that's, I think that's individual. Yeah, it depends on the reason for the induction. Um, so yes, I'm not. Uh, it, it would depend yeah. really on the reason. So inductions do happen for lots of reasons. The most common reason being that you get to the end, towards the very end of your pregnancy and over your due dates. And we, we know that pregnancies don't go on forever and ever, so we can support and help um, to start the, the labour mm -hmm. off for the, yeah. for, the, for the safety of your baby and, and your health. But we do induce women for lots of other reasons as well, and that can be for um, potential complications that have occurred in the pregnancy with you or your baby. But every, every case is looked at individually, so there isn't a, a set standard of saying this is the exact date that we would do it at the earliest or the latest. It's all about planning individually um, with you, between you, the planning between you, your midwife, your obstetrician, and that whole team working with you to find the best the best dates that work. Is that anything else you wanted to add? No. Wendy? No, it sounds good. Okay, lovely. Um, little check on questions. Um, so Anna has um, messaged in saying that she's 40, just over 41 weeks and she is anxious about induction and staying overnight in hospital without a birth partner. Are the rules relaxing? Um, I'm not sure, Wendy, what you probably know more about that. Are the rules relaxing about having a birth partner here during an induction? If, so if they have to at, stay at overnight. The moment, we're not doing um, partners overnight at the moment. And, and the rules are starting to relax. And we probably will head mm -hmm. that way. But given that you're 41 and 1, I don't think it's going to happen in the time frame that we will have your baby. Um, it's best just to keep communicating with your midwives um, on the night shift. So these are the midwives will be looking after you when your partner has gone home. Letting them know how you feel. Uh, there's definitely things we can do to help. Um, and certainly as soon as we think that you're a neighbour, your partner will be invited back in. And we won't delay that. And I think it's, just ha it's really important to have that communication open between you and the staff so they can sort of um, mitigate against being alone and you can put you in a certain room, put you with other women if that's what you want and some women might be in a side room, some women don't, they think it's really isolating. So we can do all these little things and it, and it might sound really minor but even things like aromatherapy and music can be really, really helpful in that sort of situation. Um, it's obviously not ideal, we we don't want women to be alone. Um, and so it's just trying to find the balance where you are supported as much as possible, but that we're keeping everyone unsafe as well. And so although I'd like to say that, you know, your partner will be allowed to stay overnight in the future, obviously by then you will have hopefully be at home with your lovely baby and not worrying about this sort of thing. Um, but I do hope that our staff, I think I would speak for them and say that they are really understanding um, when they're working that shift, that women are on their own, and, and that we will do what we can to support you, and, and just making sure that you know you have things in place like being able to speak to your partner on um, on like FaceTime and things, so that they feel like they're there with you, but just not in person. I know it's not a, a, probably what you wanted to hear, um, but I do want you to know that we understand that this is not great, and we don't want women to feel anxious. Um, especially in the early labour part. Absolutely. Thanks, Wendy. Okay. Thank you. So, Hannah has popped um, a little question into the chat. She's wondering about the timing of her induction, because very sadly, Hannah um, had, a, had a stillbirth at 33 weeks with a previous pregnancy. Hannah, my suggestion to you is that you discuss with your obstetrician um, and your midwife 
at your next appointment as to the planning with your pregnancy and time of induction. Um, I'm not going to suggest a, a, a timing here because obviously we, none of us would know um, your history, but I, I'm sure that they will work really closely with you to find a, a, the, the right date for you and your, and your baby um, for, for induction. I hope that answers that. But definitely just talk with the team looking yeah. after you. Um, Andrea has popped a question in. You're doing great with your questions today. That's good. <laughs> Can't be wrong with them. That's brilliant. Um, so Andrea's 37, just over 37 weeks pregnant, but she's planning to come to the Spires. Um, and she was just wondering, once she starts getting contractions, based on advice, once they're five minutes apart, lasting one minute for an hour, where should she ring? Should she ring the Spires first and then head over, or is there something else she should do? And then she follows up by saying it's probably a silly question, and it's not in any way a no silly question. Thing. No such thing as a silly question. Wendy, are we still there? Our screen's gone blank. Yeah, I, 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 can you still hear me? Yeah, I can still hear you, but are we still on? Are we still on? Because our screen, okay. we've gone to the desktop. Yes, you're still on. Okay, bear with us for a moment. Yeah. yeah, you're definitely still alive. I can see you. <laughs> we just can't see so you. So, I, I mean, I can answer that first part anyway. So, yeah, when, you, when you're... And it's I'm not so much... Mine's saying that uh, you've lost signal. Okay. Oh, yeah. Bear with us a moment. Ah, are we there? We're hoping that we'll be back on in a moment. I know there's a short time delay. Yes, you're back okay. on. Sorry about okay. that. Sorry, everybody. Should we just go through that question again in case there was a little bit of a... Mm -hmm. So, Anita's just... Uh, sorry, Andrea is just wondering if when she goes into labour, she's planning to birth on the spires, and once she starts contracting, who should she contact? Should she just come straight on in or phone the spires, yeah. or what should she do? Yeah, so, um, so what you want to do is you want to call the spires um, and hopefully um, they'll be able to, to talk to you over the phone and try and work out what's happening and whether it's time for you know you to come in or whether you could stay at home for a little bit longer. And um, that's a real thorough triage that they'll do with you to figure that out. Um, if sometimes, you know, depending on, on how many labourers they have at that time, sometimes they can't answer the phone immediately, in which case if you don't get an answer, you can call maternity assessment unit as well. Um, tell them that your plan is to is to go to the spires, but that you you know you've been un unable to make contact, and they'll invite you in, and they could probably assess you, or they'll triage you over the phone and give you the same sort of advice. Um, so yes, spires first, um, and if you're not successful with that, then MAU is absolutely fine too. Thanks, Anita. Is there anything you want to add in there, Wendy? Yeah, I think this is a good time to talk about that like, if you found a home birth or a community birth. Um, where you should call and um, mm -hmm. how it works, especially out of hours. So, um, as Anita said, if you're planning the spires, um, you will call the spires, hopefully, and if they answer, you'll be triaged. Just like Anita said, that's not really any different. Uh, if you are planning a home birth, you would generally call the Wallingford number, and this will be part of your home birth assessment, is they'll give you this number to call, and it is a number that is um, open 24-7, and it's staffed by um, a, sta a maternity support worker. And what they will do is they'll take your details any time, day or night, and they'll find the appropriate midwife to triage you. Now, this might be a midwife of the unit, Wallingford itself, or this will be, hopefully, one of your midwives from your local team. So if you're planning your birth in Whitney, as I'm in Whitney today, um, they would reach out to the on-call Whitney midwife, and that Whitney midwife would then call you back um, at home, and they would triage you over the phone. If they think that you need to be seen, they'll um, arrange make arrangements to come out to your house and assess you, and if you're in labour, they'll obviously stay with you. Um, if you're planning a birth centre birth, it is much the same. Um, you might find in the day that you're able to get through on the phone, especially if you're in early, early labour and just want some advice. Um, it can always be worth trying to you if you've got no concerns, but don't hesitate if you don't get a response to then call Wallingford, who will be able to find an on-call midwife to speak to. Um, so either way in the day, I always end up calling Wallingford, but you might have some luck getting through on the unit itself. But certainly out of hours, if you're planning on giving birth at home or in any of our standalone vision free led units, definitely start by calling Wallingford, especially at night. Does that make sense? Lovely. Thank Thanks, you. Wendy. Can I just touch very briefly on another part of that um, uh, question, which was about when to call? 
Um, and I think you said when your contractions are coming every five minutes for an hour, was that right? Okay. Yes. So I just wanted to touch on that because that, that's not absolute. Um, you know, all women are different. Um, and it's also about the, you know, what, what I don't want and what I've seen before um, and what I think is, is not beneficial is when women um, are thinking that actually it's when they're every five minutes and then all of a sudden they'll get one you know, that's three minutes, one that's four, one that's two, and they think, oh no, the midwife said ring when it's five minutes, so I've got to go in now. And sometimes women can get quite anxious about that, so it's, it's almost about the pattern as well. Um, so, you know, don't, don't worry so much if you start to have contractions that are coming a little bit more frequently than five minutes, because if they're, if they're still a little bit random, then that's absolutely fine. And just again, call the midwife, call the, the unit that you're going to, and have a chat to them about it, but don't worry about it. Thank you. I hope that answers your question, Andrea. And, and Andrea, as I said, put at the end, it's probably a really silly question, but there are no silly questions. No. This is why we do these chats, to allow you opportunity to ask any question that you want to. And please be reassured, we've probably asked them ourselves along the way, and we've certainly heard every question most yeah. times. There is no silly question. Um, and Andrea, just thank you for your answer. Yeah, that's great. So I've got um, Bex who's come up. Actually, what I might just do, because we've had quite a few changes of numbers of viewing people, um, so I'm wondering if some new people have joined us. Mm -hmm. So I think it'd be worthwhile just reintroducing ourselves so they know um, why they can see two people and hear three. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, I'm Emma. I'm the um, outpatient matron uh, for maternity, and um, I am the um, person that's always asking the questions on here. So you're probably very used to me. And then I've got Anita with me. Hello, I'm Anita. I am the team lead midwife for our caseloading team in Oxfordshire called the Lotus Team. And on Teams currently, on a mobile phone propped up next to the laptop, <laughs> is Wendy Hill. Wendy. Hello, can you all hear me? <laughs> <laughs> My internet's a bit, I'm actually in Whitney Community Hospital with Whitney Midwives today. Um, so my internet is not as good as it would be if I was at the JR, um, but needs must. Um, so yeah, I'm Wendy and I'm the matron for community. So we've got the opportunity today um, for you to ask our, our experts anything to do with community midwifery, birthing in MLUs or home births, or really any question that you want to ask um, about your pregnancy or delivery or postnatal period. We will do our very best to answer, but if we don't know the questions, we'll find someone who does. <laughs> Okay, so we've got Bex who's come in. Um, Bex is asking, are there any forms of induction which you could have on level six and still go on to labour on the spires if they were effective? Yeah. So I think off the top of my I haven't worked in induction for a while, but I think um, with the um, Proston gel, I think if you've had one Proston gel and then um, and that works, then that's absolutely fine. If you have one Proston gel and then they're able to break your waters and that's successful, I think that's also fine. Um, if you have two Proston gels, um, then no, you would have to go to the obstetric unit. And if your labour doesn't establish, so this is about established labour, not so much just having contractions, and your labour needs to be established really um, for you to be able to go to the spires after having your water spoken or one gel. Could you explain what established labour is? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. <laughs> so, and, and this is it's, it's something that actually I really get quite passionate about. So, if I go on, please stop me. <laughs> so, um, so, it's why I sort of touched again on this whole contractions every five minutes thing because, um, you know, there are there are different stages of labour. You should go through this with your with your community midwife, and if you are able to access any antenatal care, this should be covered also there. But I can definitely touch it briefly now so early labor is um, called the later phase of labor and that is where you have quite a lot of cervical change um, as well as as well as the cervix opening the first few centimeters um, and during that time you will have um, you know some uterine activity I'll call it contractions now but um, some other people call them different things um, but I'll refer to it as a contraction so you'll have some some sort of contractions but they're quite random in their pattern, you know, they might last 20 seconds, 50 seconds, 45 seconds. They could be, you know, three minutes, then five minutes apart, then seven, then two. They're really, really random. But they can, you know, they can... Um 
cause you some discomfort. And so some women, you know, if they've been told to call every, when they're every five minutes, and like I said, you get this sort of pattern of coming every three, two, five, um, and, you know, and they're, they're uncomfortable, then if you've not had a baby before and you're not familiar with that feeling, then it can be a little bit confusing. And you can think, oh, you know, is this, is this you know, am I in labour? Um, and what I've found in, in the different departments that I've worked in where I've triaged women who are um, in early labour and established labour is that they get quite disappointed when they come to the hospital. They present thinking that things are happening and then the midwife will do an assessment and, you know, the cervix will either not be open or it'll, you know, be open a centimetre. There's still quite a bit of time to go. Um, and that can be quite disheartening for women if they don't understand, um, and, and partners if they don't understand what that means. And what it is, is, you know, these random contractions that you've been having are changing your cervix. They are doing something. They're not just opening it. Um, and, and sort of knowing, knowing that can just, you know, it can just help you to sort of think, okay, you know, the, these uncomfortable um, feelings I'm having in my uterus are actually affected. They are doing something. It's not just about cervical dilation. Um, when your cervix has has changed, and by that I mean it gets shorter, it gets thinner, it gets softer, it changes its position and um, where it is. When while that's happening, you're having these random contractions. When your contractions become more consistent, and by that you typically, it's not for everybody, typically about three contractions in 10 minutes, lasting a good minute long, all of them, and having the same sort of interval between them. So a real consistent pattern. Um, usually, um, you're about four centimetres dilated at that point, three, four centimetres, and, and that's when we say that your labour's establishing. And early labour can be very random, like I said, so it can it can stop and it can start, so we don't you know, we don't admit everybody in early labour because it can last for days and you don't want to be here for that amount of time. You want to be at home in your own environment where you're comfortable and it's familiar and your oxytocin will work better. But when your labour starts to establish, then that's when we would say, OK, come on in if this is where you're going or the MLU or if you're at a home birth, the midwife will come and give you one-to-one -one care. So it's really, you can access advice in early labour, but you wouldn't really get one-to-one -one care because we're not going to do anything for you at that point that you can't really do for yourself at home by that you know, paracetamol, a bath, whatever. Um, but when you're getting into established labour, real consistent, strong contractions, cervical change from four centimetres and above, you'll get one-to-one -one care from in whatever environment you're in at that time. Does that, does that oh, answer that question? Absolutely marvellous. <laughs> I, get a bit, I get a bit carried away. It's really quite... It's so passionate. It's I, like, wonderful. I had my children before I was a midwife, and I had the early labour, established labour talk a lot of times with my midwife. So. <laughs> okay. I'm sure everybody absolutely appreciates it. Wendy, do you want to add anything to that? I don't think there's anything to add. It's amazing. Wendy, you that. You can add you nothing. Can you can add nothing. <laughs> She's fabulous, absolutely fabulous. So um, on to the next question. So Elizabeth has asked um, about induction. I think it's the theme today is induction, yeah. which is absolutely fine. Um, we mentioned earlier that prostin wasn't used for a while and is now used again for inducing labour. Why was it stopped and then brought back? I'm happy to answer that. Yeah, yeah what? probably that's yeah, right. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Um, and Wendy, butt in if there's anything. So we we um, brought in the uh, the Foley's catheter induction really um, during COVID times to enable women to um, be able to go home during the the induction process and to make it easier for women that way. Because once you are being induced, you have to stay in hospital. So we try to make it an easier time, particularly in those very early days of, of COVID when, when you couldn't have anybody in hospital with you until you were in established labour. But actually there's been quite a big audit done um, over the use of the Foley's catheter. And we can see um, that the Foley's catheter can cause some delays with labour and can increase the risk of needing a, a cesarean, an emergency cesarean section. So with looking at all of the data from the audit, um, the two things of potentially um, making the labour longer, as well as um, the increased risk of emergency cesarean, it was felt we should go back to offering prostins. Although for some women, as we said earlier, actually the Foley's catheter is more appropriate and that will be discussed with you as to what is the best option for you um, and, and your baby. But that's the reason why we did it. 
So hopefully that explains it. Um, we're up to date on questions. Oh, Yay! I think you, you just have one missing. When did you say one missing? One missing. Um, Emily Barnes. Is that a new one? No, it was above, um, above the one you just asked. Do you know I haven't got that at all? Am I being really daft? That's what I've asked. Do you want to read it out, Wendy? Otherwise, Davis. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is Emily, and she said, "Do all Oxfordshire units support VBAC? I'm otherwise a low risk pregnancy." I'm uh, sorry, I haven't asked that. So Go on then, yeah. <laughs> um, so we a bit, so with VBAC, so that's vaginal birth after cesarean. The recommendations for the guidelines is not. This is not a must do, but our guideline is that you have continuous monitoring in labour. And the only place that we do that in Oxford at the moment is delivery suite at the John Wright Clinic. So that would be our first recommendation. Um, but we, we don't stipulate where you give birth. There's always a choice. So it's up to you to make that informed decision. So you'll probably have um, an appointment in the back clinic, which is the birth after cesarean clinic. And if your choice is really um, left field, which is great, we love a left field birth choice, um, you might have an appointment in the birth choices clinic as well. And both these clinics are, are not there to sort of tell you what, you what you need to do. They're there to make sure you have all the information, all the resources you can to make a decision. So we would support a VBAC birth anywhere in community. Um, as, long as, you, as long as we feel that you've been able to make that decision yourself um, and that you're happy, we're very happy to support you. Um, so, for example, if someone do, do birth at home after a cesarean, um, Spire is becoming quite a popular option because women feel it's a sort of in-between. So they feel that at least they're close enough to the obstetric unit, um, but they decline the monitoring side of it. So they're still in the hospital, but they don't have continuous monitoring. Um, you can even be on delivery suite and decline the monitoring side of it. So there is, it's not... Um, uh, sort of, if you go to one place, you have to have everything that place offers. You can sort of, sort of like a pick and mix of things that we offer. Um, and it's just having that open communication with your community certified first of all, to decide sort of what route you want to go down. And also, you might need information about the type of cesarean you have last time. And uh, sometimes that can um, sway your decision making. So, for example, certain cesareans, it's very unusual, but if you had a really tricky cesarean, it might be that. Um, a certain birth might be not best advised. Um, other cesareans are very much, oh yes, absolutely fine for vaginal birth. So you might need more information about your previous birth as well before making a decision. Have I covered everything with that, guys? I mean, and obviously so these, are, these are your clinics, so you might need to add something like this. <laughs> yeah, that sounds fine. Yeah, yeah, we've got the birth choices clinic, I think, that yeah. um, Wendy spoke about, um, which your midwife or your obstetrician could refer you to if you wanted to discuss further about birthing outside of guidelines um, and that's to ensure as Wendy said that you have all of the information to be able to make those those choices. And just to say you know the earlier you sort of get in and, and ask for um, a referral to the birth choices clinic the better really. Um, I'm not sure what's the minimum? Do you know the minimum that they'll see women? As in as Gestation. Yeah, because you want to get a real good birth plan in place. So you really need to, you know, um, rather than leaving it to it's sort very of individual, and it yeah. does depend. You see a wide range of um, yeah. women within the clinic with um, wide ranging discussions. Yeah. So it's very much on an individual thing. But if you if you speak to your community midwife or obstetrician and say that you you're interested in this, they'll help you to decide if the birth choices clinic is the right place to yeah. be seen or if there's a different um, team that, that need to see you, that would you be advised to see to help you make those those decisions. Yeah. Okay, I've just refreshed my page and I'm seeing all the questions now. <laughs> um, so we've got some thank yous. So Andrea has thanked us for the advice earlier, um, as has Bex, as has Elizabeth, and also Emily, and, and she, she's made said that it's great to have the reassurance mm -hmm. so that's really good good lovely so we're on our last few minutes it's flown by today actually yeah. helped by all the questions so thank you so if there is anything else that you do want to ask this is your time to get your question in because we will be closing the chat down shortly um, 
But I think what we'll do is we'll go um, around the panellists, put them on the spot, and ask for what would be a bit of advice you would like to give to the people that are watching and listening. Oh. <laughs> I, 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 mean, I think it's very difficult at the moment because we're not able to provide antenatal education um, from your community team at the moment. Um, but if you are able to access that in any other way, and that's accessing these chats, whatever, you know, any sort of reading you can do yourself. Um, I just think antenatal education is really, really important. Um, and yeah, um, there are lots of ways you can access it. Um, and just yeah, yeah, really, just you know, have a read about what to expect and what to bring to the hospital. Um, you know, again, about these stages of labour, um, about the postnatal initial postnatal period. Just, just really, yeah, access some education. Lovely, Wendy. Over to you. Bit of advice. Um, I'm really passionate about community births. I love promoting home births and births in our um, community units as well. So I think. My advice would be um, to have an open mind. Um, home birth is not for you know the the very few who are of a certain mindset. It's open to all, and it can be an amazing place to have your baby. Um, so my advice would be to go have a little read about home birth, have a read about birthing in community in general, speak to a community midwife, watch a few videos. On, if you can on YouTube, if, if that's if you think you can bear it, they're actually magical. I think yeah, like that. They are. Um, and just sort of think about what it would mean to have your baby at home. And the one little thing I will say is that the community guys will clean up after you. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, we don't need you in a mess. I promise. We do take all our rubbish away and we clean your floors. I remember as a student midwife cleaning someone's carpet before we even. <laughs> So I I see now my husband is cleaning the carpet. Yeah, me too. Thanks, Wendy. I think my bit of advice is probably one that I give out every week, and I I don't bore of it. I don't tire of it at all. It's it's always ask the questions you have. They are never silly. They are never daft. Ask your midwife. Ask your obstetrician. Ask any of the healthcare professionals. You'll hear a lot of. Um, birth stories between friends or online or on TV programs um, that actually get get the real truth mm. from the professionals that are looking after you um, so never be afraid to ask any question mm. and second to that if you have any worries or concerns just contact MAU or your community midwife if it's within hours or, or non-urgent um, don't ever feel well I'll just wait and see it's worrying me but I'll wait and see MAU is a 24-7 service and the midwives there will talk you through things on the phone or invite you in if you need to be seen but that's what they're there for is to um, support you and help you yeah. so use them um, that's my, my little bit of um, advice I and one of, one of the questions to ask on that going back to my little early labour bit is if you do go in and you are assessed um, and they tell you what your what how how dilated your cervix is. Ask what else. It's not just about dilation. Ask what else. What else is my cervix doing? Because that's really good to compare. You know, at the next assessment and sort of get a good idea of, of you know how your body's changing. Lovely. Thank you. Well, I think we've probably come to a natural end. A few minutes early, but we haven't got any further questions. So I think if um, Wendy, Anita, are you happy that we yeah. bring this to an end now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah lovely. I'd like to thank everybody for filling the hour with so many good questions. I'm hoping that you found it um, helpful and we look forward to seeing you in two weeks' time. Bye. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye. for now. Bye.